Hamilton, and we are going to begin episode three, the book of God, and we're going to look at a timeline in a very unusual way. Not only do we have an outline of mobility, but we have the booklets that have been provided for you. So, um, as you open your booklet, I would also ask that you would open your Bible to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 5 through 7. Proverbs 4, 5 through 7. The way we're going to do our timeline as we're turning there is we're going to look at the literature of Scripture and the geographic uh, aspects, the different areas that we see covered in the land of the Bible, and that's going to give us an overview of the chronology of the Bible from about 4,000 plus BC all the way up through the end of the first century AD. So Proverbs chapter 4. Beginning at verse 5 through verse 7. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme, therefore, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. In a study like this, I feel is in accordance with the problem. When we read the Bible so often, it seems like a series of stories that are perhaps not connected. When we look at the Bible uh, chronologically, maybe it can add some connective tissue to help us to see how it does indeed follow one train of thought, the redemptive history that God has laid out in the Bible. Now, it's a little difficult if you're simply reading through the Bible to pick up on that chronology because the books aren't necessarily in chronological order. However, they do fall naturally into three different categories in the Old Testament of literature. And that's how I have it broken down, and that's how we're going to begin looking at the Old Testament chronological overview based on the literary divisions of the Old Testament. The three divisions are historical books, then you have the poetical books, and then you have the prophetical books. Now, under the historical books, we understand stand them, especially the first five, to be foundational for everything that follows. Those first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are what's known as the books of Moses. Books of the law, the five scrolls, or the Pentateuch. They indeed do lay the foundation, beginning with Genesis, that talks about the beginnings of everything concerning time and man and relationship to God. In the book of Exodus, we find that God's people are in bondage by that time. They need a deliverance, and God provides that for them. In Leviticus, we learn what it means in an illustrated sermon that's very difficult to read and understand about what it is to be holy and in right relationship with God. In Numbers, we see the children of Israel fail and they end up wandering around in the wilderness for many years. In Deuteronomy, we find them camped out right outside the promised land, which is their destination since they've been set free 40 years earlier, preparing to go into the land. Now, that first section of time we can mark out basically as about 4,000 plus BC to about 17, 16, 1500 BC. So about 25, roughly 2,500 years in those first five books are actually covered, and they are the foundational books for everything that follows. The next set of historical books are formation books, books of formation. God has, has brought the children of Israel into the land in the book of Joshua that he promised to Abraham. And the land is broken up among the 12 tribes. And um, the people are settling in the land. And so finally, it seems like 
uh, the everything that God had promised the children of Israel is going to come to fruition, and everything is going to be great. They finally achieve success by coming into the land, but things don't work out that way. Uh, Joshua ends, uh, enters the land with the children of Israel in about 1400 B.C. And Joshua judges in Ruth. The first three books cover about 400 years of the people in the land. Now, the book of Joshua simply tells about when they came in, how they conquered all the peoples living in the land. And then they assumed the ownership by tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob. Uh, they assumed ownership of the land. After the book of Joshua ends, we have the book of Judges, where uh, it seems to be an endless cycle of the people that are supposed to have come into the land now and worship God in the way that He desires, they continue to fail. And God raises up a judge to lead the people um, in, in the, the um, destruction or the victory over somebody who did, has been raised up to conquer them. See what happens is, in the book of Judges, is these cycles where the people do really good for a while and then they start to slip away from God. And so God sends another people to judge them. And so another group attacks them. And once they've had enough, God sends a judge to deliver them. And so after God does that, the people say, oh, now we see what God has done. He's delivered us. We're going to serve him again. And it's not too long before the people fall into all kinds of idolatry and sin. And for like 300 years, that's all they do. It's just this cycle of sin and deliverance. Sin and deliverance. So some of the judges you might know, like Deborah, which is a woman judge. Uh, she leads, she has a general, but she leads the people in deliverance. And Samson, who's also a judge. And then, during that time of the judges, you have a book of Ruth, which is a book of hope in the midst of that dark time of God's judgment and deliverance, God's judgment and deliverance, over and over again, and it tells a wonderful story. It's one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. Now, that time, like you said, begins in about 1400 B.C. Then, beginning with the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, what we have is the rise of kings in Israel, and ultimately then the collapse by the end of Second Chronicles. So that second section of the, of the formation books is a part of the history. What we see is through First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second um, Chronicles is this. Samuel is this guy who is the last judge. The period that we just came out. Samuel is the guy who's the last judge, but he's also a prophet. And the people begin to clamor, the, the children of Israel in the land, they begin to clamor. They want a king because they want to be like all other nations. But that's not God's plan for his people. God's plan is that I'll be your king and you be my people. But they want to be like everyone around them. You know, it's like when a, a, a child comes to a king. I want to do this because so-and-so is doing this. And you say, well, if they jump off a bridge or whatever it is, you know, would you do that? Of course not. Parents try to do that with the kids. Allow them a distinction um, among family rights. This is how we do it in our family. We don't have to be like everybody else. But the people persisted and persisted. And God finally said, okay, you want a king? Pick one. They picked this king. His name was Saul. He was head and shoulders above everyone else. And so he looked like the king. And he did okay at first, but then he began to fail. And he slipped into depression, and he slipped into um, demonic activity. He was definitely oppressed, and he would go into these fits. And there was this young guy, and his name was David. And David would be called in to soothe the king by playing his harp. He would sing music and play, sing songs and play music to the king to help the king get delivered from all of this oppression. And Saul would get mad and throw spears at David, and David would grow a little older, and finally David has to run for his life because Saul is after him because Samuel has obeyed God, and God has said, the people have chosen Saul, but I've chosen David to be the next king. So 
saw the things of God, this is what God said, I'm going to put money to David to preserve my kingdom. He begins to chase David right around the countryside. Now, David has a chance to take Saul's life, but he doesn't because he recognizes that God has put a seal of approval for that time period on Saul. And so he's faithful and he waits until Saul ends up ultimately in battle and takes his own life. And then David ascends to the throne. And David's life is up and down, up and down. He goes really good for a while, he goes really bad. He has some of the lowest points of the Old Testament and some of the lowest points that he experiences in his life. He brings the kingdom together, those 12 tribes. He brings them all together and forms one nation. But he's on the, on the, on the roof of his house, and he looks out and he sees some woman taking a bath while he should be out doing battle like other kings do at that time of year. And he says, I like that woman, and I'm the king, so I'm going to have her. And he does, and all kinds of trouble ensues from there. And the problems that David has are never quite get resolved, gets resolved in his own life, and they play out in the life of his family. But David has one son, and his son is Solomon. Solomon is the son that God has chosen to be the next king of Israel. And Solomon is very wise. As a matter of fact, God is willing to grant Solomon whatever Solomon asks. So Solomon prays and says, Lord, give me wisdom. So God endows Solomon with great wisdom. But that family problem creeps back up. That problem with women. And Solomon has a bunch of wives and concubines. Thousand of them told him. The guy must have been out of his mind. And upon his death, there's some struggle for the throne. And one of the sons of Herobotam takes leadership. And it's going to assume the throne in place of his father Simon. And when the time comes for him to do that, instead of calling on his father's advisors, because kings need advisors, all leaders need somebody to bounce things off of, right? Solomon was a wise man. He had wise older advisors. They'd grown up, they'd seen things, they understood how life was. Here's Rehoboam, rather than, as he assumes kingship, rather than going to his father's counsels, he decides that he's going to choose counsels from among his kids. Guys his own age, you know, young, and they know everything. They're so smart. And they give him some really bad advice. And what that does is it creates a situation where this kingdom that has been united, the kingdom of Israel and the David, now becomes divided and becomes two kingdoms. Ten of those twelve tribes from what's called Israel, and we'll look at maps in a minute, and two in the south, Judah and Benjamin, become the southern kingdom. And they play out in the history of uh, some part of the remainder of the Testament. Then what you have in order of the history of the books are Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Now, at some point, without getting too far ahead of myself, Judah, that southern kingdom, finds itself in bondage, and they're allowed to go home again to reestablish Jerusalem as their capital and reestablish their worship again in Jerusalem. Ezra, Nehemiah, tell that story. Esther tells another story that we'll talk about in a minute when we're at the next. These are called post exilic historical books, or after the exile. In Babylon, the people were captive. Okay? So those are the historical books, and they take us all the way from 4004 BC all the way to 400 BC. 4000 BC to 400 BC. And all through that time period, there's warnings and then there's hope. There's desperation and there's hope. There's good times and there's bad times. The Bible simply paints 
a picture of real human life. Things aren't always good, but things aren't always bad either. And in the story of redemption, although not all of the details are included, there is a balanced picture of what God is doing with a certain people that will become the Jews. Now let's go to the poetic books. Now these books cover a time period of about 2000 BC to about 400 BC. Now, I say 2000 BC because that's about the time that Job was written. Or at least the, the life of Job took place about 2000 BC. Really don't know when it was written, but those events in his life played out in about 2000 BC. Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon, those are inspirational books, basically, that were written around the time of David and Solomon and afterward. So, really, about 1000 BC to about 400 BC when they were all collected. Because some of them were um, portions written at different times, and then an editor collected them and put them in a book. And included them in the list of the scriptures that should be considered canon. So, Job tells the story about sovereignty even in the midst of suffering. And the purpose is so that Job, who's a really good guy, could not just glory in his goodness, but rather see God through the midst of all his trouble and realize that God is in control no matter what happens in our lives. The Psalms become Israel's song book. So they celebrate the victories. They ask for God's vindication upon enemies. They moan and bewail uh, all of the trials and tribulations of life. There's songs of repentance. There's songs that cry for help. And those songs were songs that simply praise the Lord. We call us to do that no matter what we face in life. There's the book of Proverbs, which I read from a little bit earlier. They are simply wise sayings written primarily by Solomon, but also by a lot of other people. As a matter of fact, Moses wrote a problem. Did you know that? Moses wrote a problem. And it's King Lemuel and a few others that write the Proverbs that were collected over time and then put into a book called the Proverbs. Then there's Ecclesiastes, which was written by Solomon. And, you know, he says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Like, he's lived, he's wise, he's seen. All of this pursuits in life are short. And he says, look, everything you chase after life really doesn't mean what it is. And it comes down to the knowledge of God, getting wisdom, getting understanding about who God is and the relationship to Him. It's not something that didn't find this before God. It's a shame it took him, you know, to the end of his life to realize that. And then there's the Psalm of Solomon, which is a love story. Some have called it a marriage name. About two lovers that can't wait to get to each other. And so it's just, it's a wonderful, it really is a wonderful love story. Let me just take a break from that and say that people have tried to make that an analogy and, and say that's how Christ loved the church. And certainly Christ does love the church and the church is to love Christ as he is the bride and the bride. But this is a story of human love that is born from a heart of love. That's really the one. In other words, this is a picture of what it really means in God's plan to love your husband and your wife. It's a wonderful story you should read it sometime. And you might bless. Those are the inspirational, poetical books. Then you have the prophetical books that are books of anticipation. Beginning with Isaiah through Daniel, they're the major prophets. There's five of them, just like there are five books that begin to form the foundation for all the rest of the So there are five major prophets who are major because their writings are larger. And they write between the years of sometime in the 700s through the 500s BC. Basically, they chastise people, tell them to repent say there are better days. Some of them are all about the trials and tribulations of God's people. He 
because of their own sin and because of God's judgment. But God never leaves them with that hope. So meet them in the books that are glimmers of hope that anticipate something better. In a way, the same with the next section of books, Hosea through Zephaniah, which are the minor prophets, and there's 12 of them. And the minor because they write less than two. And they write from roughly the 800s BC to the 600s BC. And then we have the last three in the Old Testament. Right the eyes of the Lord. Now they can be compared, if you look to the left on the chart, with Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther. Because they take place at about the same time after what we're going to learn to be the, the Babylonian captivity and the return under the Persians. These are prophets that now, once the people are allowed to return to their own land and rebuild the temple and rebuild the walls and decide to worship of the one true living God. They, again, the people not only do that, but they fall into some of the same old temptations and trials. And these prophets write and say, Stop it, don't do that again. Know this, though, that there is going to be a deliverer coming. So these are books about restoration and about hope and about watching your P's and Q's when it comes to serving God and about not reliving your mistakes from the past. Come on, let's look to the future. Let's do this God's way. Today I should have said to the Inner Testament period, how you guys are writing the Archive of the 500s to the 400s BC. I know that's a lot of information to take in and I'm not going to spend much time on the maps, which will essentially just be a recap of this. What I want you to do is go back and take a look at this once you get in the service and you can kind of see the parallels between how I have these divided and the time periods that change by now. So now on the right hand side of the page, we have this map of the ancient Near East. That's where the Bible takes place. The events in the Bible takes place in, in, in what is known as the ancient Near East. And this really could be used as a map for the book of Genesis, primarily. If you look over the, the towards the right hand side and towards the bottom, right above the two in Egypt, we'll see a little place called Urban. If you identify that, now you know where Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, the father of Israel, was from. He was a moon worshiper, the verse of the world, and that's where God called him from. He said, go to the land that I show you. That's Genesis chapter 12. He goes north and west to Haran. Stops him, God said, don't stop. Continue on. So he's making this big triangle. And then he goes back down over by the Mediterranean Sea. He spot to Lucy again. Right off the sea coast, just to the east, just above Moab, which is in red, it says Jerusalem. That will later become the capital. If he walks all around that land, goes down into Egypt, gets in a little bit of trouble down in Egypt, heads out of Egypt. But that land that he walks in there around Jerusalem, that's the land that God promises to the Jewish people. Within this land, we see creation. We see the flood. We see how the nations are dispersed. We see the rise of Abraham and the promise to the land. This is where Job lived that I mentioned. As a matter of fact, this is the land of all the patriarchs that came to be known as the 12 tribes of Israel. And I'll take them right here. So this is Genesis, if you will. Exodus is a different story. Because by the end of Genesis, the children of Israel are down in Egypt because of a famine and because Joseph, one of the brothers uh, of the 12 tribes, was down there and uh, he was able to provide for his family so they wanted up in Egypt. And there was a king at the beginning of Exodus that didn't know Joseph from the end of Genesis. 
And the children of Israel were growing in number, and the king of Egypt got afraid and said, Let's put them in bondage. So God gets them stay in bondage for about 400 years, and he decides to deliver them. And so this is the root, if you'll notice that red line from where you see Egypt, that they took out of Egypt, crossing the northern part of the Red Sea, heading down to Mount Sinai, where they camped out after a couple of months after leaving. That's where they got to keep the Commandments. From there, they headed up, and they had to take a series of jobs because they were getting attacked, and they were failing God, and they weren't believing, and they were grumbling, and they were complaining about everything. They got good to be the going their way. I mean, they had food and water in Egypt, and now God has taken them out, and I wish we were back in Egypt, but at least we had that. Or instead, we're running around the world. This is what we're going to do. We're going to die. We don't have food. God sends manna from heaven to feed them. And they begin to complain about that. Same thing every day. Blah, 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 blah. And as it turns out, they end up wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. And they end up coming to God on the right side of the map. Just north of Mount Nebo. In fact, Moses looks across from Mount Nebo into the promised land, which would be to the west, where it says Canaan, and the promised land. Moses looks over from that point so we can see the promised land because he's not allowed to go there. God said, You can take the people this far, but you've messed up with me, and you disobeyed me, and you make him an example. Leadership, not to do this, for people not to do this, but it's raised Moses was to fail, and all he was allowed to do would be to look over into the promised land. That's what we want to do this way. So this map is Exodus essentially to Deuteronomy. Go to the next map, and here we have Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, and 1 Samuel. Once they get in the land, the land is divided among the 12 tribes. Here they are. This is the promised land. This is the way that it stays from about 1400 BC to about 1000 BC. You can see how the 12 tribes are divided. You see Judah down there at the bottom with Benjamin right above it towards the center. And the other tribes to the north of that, several of them, including Dan and Ephraim, they will be included in the northern. Over. And the mass of God moved on the other side to the east. Look at the other map now. And that second Samuel to first Kings and first Chronicles. Now what happens here is after the children go in and they get their land established according to the tribes, Saul becomes king, and there's this move to unite the kingdom into one. Of course, Saul doesn't see it, but David does. After reigning for several years, David, David is able to establish the Jerusalem as his capital. He had one unified king. No longer are they divided tribes, even fighting amongst one another, but now they're one nation strong under David, and that continues under Solomon, and that's where the first temple is built, because Solomon builds the temple, and he does it in Jerusalem. Now, this is uh, what the landscape looked like from about 1050 BC to about 930 of Solomon's day. Flip to the next page. And this is what happened to me in the world that when Solomon Sun takes over the kingdom of God. Remember that? The kingdom is split into Judah, down to bottom, with their capital. Jerusalem, and then up north, what we have is the kingdom of Israel. That's where the 12 tribes are to be in the southern. The their capital is Samaria. So now, from one kingdom, we have two kingdoms. This is like Second Kings and Second Chronicles. And a lot of the prophets write within this world as well.
give you something to absorb them. Now, let's go to the next map. What I want to do with this map, because it looks a little big, I want to identify a couple of places on the map. First, towards the center, a little above the center of the map, find the Syria. Just put your finger on Syria. Then go south, west, and middle, and you'll find Israel and Judah. Over by the Sea of You see that? In 722 BC, Assyria gains a military power and they go down and they attack Israel and they essentially take captives from Israel back into their land, their kingdom, and they cause them to intermarry with other people, breaking down Jewish or Israeli ties which will break down their religion and cause them to be like everybody else. Then they take other conquered peoples and they infuse them back in that northern section around Samaria and they cause the Jews that they allow to remain there or the Israelites that they allow to remain there, they cause them to intermarry with other people from other places again to break down their religious ties. In 586, Ultimately, what happens, or by that time, the Babylons overthrow the Assyrians. So, go from Assyria to go south and east to defend Babylon. They now rise in power. In 605, actually, they uh, begin to deport people from Judah, that southern part of the kingdom, because now the northern part is obliterated, okay? The southern part of the kingdom, they go over and they essentially say, hey, listen, we're going to start deporting you. We want you to pay tribute to us. You can kind of hang on to your own land, but don't get too, um, you know, haughty about it. And we'll let you kind of just go on with life as usual. We won't impose that many rules. We have some, but those rules will cause a lot of dissension among the Jewish people and their faith. When the Jewish kings act foolishly, we would think. And ultimately, 586. Uh, under Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians go and they wipe out Jerusalem and Judah, allow a few people to stay in the land and take everybody back to the Babylon as captives. And then what you have at the end of the Old Testament, look all the way to the eastern side of the mountain, over to the right, and you see Media and Persia. Those two become one empire, the Persian Empire. And they, are large, they become larger than the first two, Assyria and Babylon. And eventually, in about 539 to 538 BC, they overthrow not only the Babylonians, but also all the way over to Judah. They are the power to recognize at the end of the Old Testament. The really cool thing about the Medio Persian and the Persian Empire is that the first king, Cyrus, allows the Jews that have been taken away in the Babylonian captivity. Some, by the way, are over in Persia by that time. He allows them to go home and rebuild the temple and rebuild the walls and reestablish the worship. That's Esther and Jeremiah. Esther, that book I mentioned earlier, that takes place over in Persia, which is also a wonderful story, which, by the way, I taught on that book this past Wednesday at another church. Where one of the Jewish feasts is established called Purim. And someday I'll teach uh, on that feast too. It's a really, really neat feast. So that essentially is what is happening in the Old Testament. God has made for himself a people. They fail him. They end up in captivity. But finally, the Old Testament is what they hope. Because the people, through all of these kingdoms and all of their dispersions, the people get to go back home. And it's like they're starting over. And they don't want to make the same mistakes again. That's where the Old Testament leaves us. Are there any questions about anything? Oh, it's a lot of material, I think. That's why the book will help you to digest it. Any questions? Yes, Rhonda. Okay. Back when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, yes. um, out of my mind, I was always thought that they were searching sort of around. No, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. 
because this is a real Jedi map. They did kind of go round and round and, and read, but this is more of a general map, so it doesn't give the specifics. So this hits the high points of their journey, but they were back and forth all over the place. Yeah. And, and finally, they made that the that Mount Nebo, which is the most important thing. But a great generation has to buy it. So for 40 years, I think it should have taken that long. Yeah. Um, so it should have taken that long. months. It took them 40 years. And so, yeah, they're back and forth in all over the place. And they came back in places for a while. They get attacked, have all kinds of issues, complain, right? Moses gets mad at him, you know. God puts Moses, Moses at ease. Um, but Moses is so frustrated that his father in law has to say, but his father in law can't be stuck there. Moses, you gotta quit trying to do this with you. You know, it's really not good for your health. So he has to pick out some advisors to help him be the people too. So it's much more time to do it than you want to do any other, uh, any other questions? Yes, Tim. You know what, Robert and Moses, right? Um, you know what? That is a great question. I don't know. I'll have to look it up, but I'll find it. I'll look it up. Hmm? Oh, the question for the video. Hey, video. What's the question? What father did Moses write? I don't know, but I'll get back with you on that. Any other questions before we go on? And I'm going to cover the other question that I really, really quickly. Okay, let's find our place. Now in the book, like between the testaments and my origin. Between the testaments and my origin. Now remember I said that the Old Testament is a green legend. The Old Testament ends with the Persians, 538 and afterwards. There is another kingdom that's on the rise, the Greek kingdom. Philip of Macedon assumes kingship of Macedonia, which is the northern part of Greece. They look at as barbarians, but he has a son. By the way, Macedonia is over on the left side of the map towards the top. Greece, right in Egypt. He has a son named Alexander who was born in 356 BC, trained by Aristotle, becomes the next king, and essentially claims the land of the Persians for the Greeks and extends it a little farther east into India. So, there in yellow, you can see how large the, the Greek Empire becomes. Now, not only does he take land, but he also, because his teacher was Aristotle, and Aristotle said, if you want to really be effective, everybody has to speak the same language. Greek was his language. So, essentially, what he did was, he made available for everyone to speak the Greek language, and they did. It. it becomes the common language, as a matter of fact, from 300 BC to 300 AD. People spoke Greek in that course, in that area of the world. So Alexander conquers the day known world, including Jerusalem and Judea, which is in the center of the map to the west. You can see that narrow strip over there by the Mediterranean Sea, heading down to Egypt. He conquers all that. So now the Greeks are in charge. He says the Persians in the Holy Land, as we call it. And upon his death in 322, he died as a young man. His kingdom was split among his generals. I'm not going to spend time on these maps, really. Look at the next page and look at all the different colors. Those were his generals, and those are the lands that his generals got. To become critical, the pink and the green, the Seleucids, and the Ptolemies. Look at the map now on the bottom. And what you have is the Seleucid Empire, the pink empire, being inside of the whole right there on the sea. 
Does everyone see that? So, that is a very critical land mass. It's right on the water, and it's a great trade route north to south. And ultimately, from the west, which is ironic because we can go over to the east coast, on into the east coast. So, you see how that could be a critical land mass for trade. People are all the time fighting, even today, over that area. They want that area because it's so valuable. Well, in the intestinal period, you have ultimately the Seleucids, the Syrian Seleucids, taking charge from the Ptolemies down in Egypt of Israel. Turn to the next map. During this time, what you have is Israel now divided into three sections Galilee in the north with kind of Capernaum right there by that big blue dot, which becomes Jesus' headquarters, by the way. That's, kind of, that's a, a trade city, a large, large important city there in Galilee. Then you have Samaria in the middle, the town and the area, and then down in the south you have Judea, which is the land of the Jews that came back from the captivity with Jerusalem as their capital. And then you have a fourth area called Idumea. That's where Herod is from. Idumea was established by the Edomites. I don't want to go into the history, but the Edomites were under God's judgment and they attacked God's people whenever they had kings when they should have protected them. All this is coming into play in your testimony period. If you look at the next map, Rome takes charge in 63 BC. Pompey, the general, marches into Rome, goes into the temple that has now been rebuilt. This is the second temple. And in 37 BC, Herod is put in charge, given oversight of Israel. It's now a Roman province. Upon his death, it's divided into these different faded areas. He died in 4 BC. Just, just after Jesus' birth. So now, we're getting into the New Testament era. Flip the page. I just want to point out something about that New Testament period before we go on. This is essentially what the world is beginning to look like. All that red was the Roman Empire. All around the Mediterranean Sea. Judea is over there on the right side of the map. Right on the sea. I detailed the religious and political developments in that time period. You're going to have to go back and, I suppose, read them and see how things can inspire in that Old Testament period from the time of Alexander. Afterwards, the Greek culture became prevalent because of Alexander. Rome was the power of today by the time we get to the New Testament. Roman roads were in place. There were commercial centers that were very important and prosperous by that time. Greek was the common language, as I mentioned. Uh, now, the Hebrew scriptures uh, from the Old Testament were in Greek. And um, religious circle was very high by the time we had to the time of Jesus. And that second temple that was built, because of the factions that had developed within Judaism, um, it was a little uh, precarious. And ultimately, what we see in 70 AD is the fall of Judaism in the land. So I detail that out for you a little more. Let's go to the chronology of the New Testament. Let's give you an overview. Let's look at the literature. First, we see the historical books, also three types of literature. This is the realization of the promise of everything that the Old Testament spoke about. The people failed so often, God was going to send them a deliverer. He did time and time again. But there would be an ultimate deliverer. And in the New Testament, we see him show up on the scene. And that story of realization is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written in the 40s to the 60s AD. And John is written sometime afterwards, maybe in the 80s to 85 or so. John is an old man looking back at everything that wasn't written about Jesus, but apparently God had impressed him that there were still things that needed to be written. And so he writes his gospel, knowing that Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic gospels. They contain essentially the same symbols. Knowing that they didn't include it all, so John writes to fill in the blanks. Knowing that he's an old man in his time, so he wants to make sure that everything said about Jesus finally gets said that needs to be said. And then we have the book of Acts. The book of Acts is about the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ as it's told in the gospels. The book of Acts covers a time frame of about AD 30 to AD 66 or 67, so through the 30s and the, from the 30s to the 60s is what the book of Acts does. That was written by Luke. As a matter of fact, it's the second part of the book of Luke. The second volume in two volumes set. Then you have the letters. They were written from the late 40s through the 90s. AD, so the first century AD. You have Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus and Philemon. All those were written by Paul. That first set, it was written by Paul to churches. The second set, Timothy, Titus, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Paul wrote to individuals. Then you have the book of Hebrews. Nobody knows who it was written to, but it was written, in my estimation, just before the destruction of that second people in AD 70. And then the last section, James through Jude, are known as the general epistles or general letters. And they bear the name of the author, and they're writing to various groups. They have to be the book to determine what it's written to. Notice Paul writes, and who, to whom Paul writes, well, they get the name. Paul writes to the Romans, that's where the book name comes from. He writes to the Corinthians, that's where the book name comes from. In the general epistles, though, James writes to the book of James. Peter writes first and second Peter. Sorry, I forgot the first. So you can write it by Peter. Those are all books of instruction, all those letters. And then, of course, you have the books of the prophets, or the, the prophetical books, rather. That's Revelation. That's that third classification. And that was written in about 95 AD, at the end of the first century. And that was written by John. And that's a book of the consummation of all things. Genesis talks about the beginning, the foundation. This is the consummation of all things. Everything has come full circle now. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The things that are happening in the world, the things that are going to happen in the end of all things, when God and His people will dwell together like they did in the garden in perfect harmony for all of the nations. So those are the divisions of the New Testament. We have a couple of maps here. If you look at the first map, this is a map of Jesus' ministry. Basically, the land was looking like this all of Jesus' life, but especially in his adulthood. This is in this map is everywhere that Jesus went, except for when he was a baby and he went down to Egypt. The man who changed the world, Big Willie Carter, in the borders of this man. And it's small. New Jersey. Barely bigger than New Jersey, this man. He starts out, of course, down in Bethlehem as a baby, but his ministry begins at the gallery at the top, in the Capernaum, around the lake. You see a gallery. He's been residing in Nazareth, a little south, and rest of the day. So he grew up. His headquarters are in ministry is in the 
sometimes you go check into the solution that you can to buy and you're buying the same for the bank. Sometimes you go through Samaria. Sometimes he crosses over the river or goes through Korea. It depends on who's mad at him and what his purpose is. I briefly showed you the map of Herod's kingdom and how it was divided up among uh, his family members. You can put that and look at it some other time. Well, while Jesus was alive, sometimes the things that he said put him in jeopardy based on the, the political region that he was in. And so one time he goes over to Korea and he goes down to Jerusalem from that river because he needs to avoid some political dissension. So he just bypasses all that altogether. Another time he goes through Samaria because he has to meet the woman at the well. He has to instruct James and John, his disciples, about some things that are going on. And so, essentially, this is the map of Jesus' life, ultimately ending down just outside of Jerusalem. That is the gospel story. The propagation of the gospel in the book of Acts and following. If you look at that black and white map, you see the arrows all pointing towards Jerusalem. On the day of Pentecost that we read about in the book of Acts, all the people that were Jews or God-fearing Greeks came from all around that area to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And Peter preaches, and 3,000 get saved on the first day. They put the faith in Jesus. And there was the miracle of speaking in tongues, and all of this happens. And then eventually people all go home and they take the message home. The message of Jesus begins its propagation in their homeland. What a brilliant plan. Send people all one place, let a preacher preach the sermon, and then everybody goes home, tells them what happens when they met Jesus. Well, there's this guy named Paul, and he doesn't like it at all. And he's chasing these Christians, these little Christ, these Christ followers around. But God stops him in his track, in his tracks, and he becomes a Christian himself, a Christ follower. And it's not too long until he starts spreading the message and begins to go on missionary trips. And that's the map that we see below that black and white map, all of Paul's missionary travels. Where he goes spreading the gospel to various places around the Mediterranean Sea and the Roman Empire, establishing churches. And those churches that he establishes are the same churches that he writes letters to, to encourage them and to correct them to let them know that he's thinking about them, praying for them, to let them know what they can do for him. And that's what we see in the blue and gray at the top of the next page. All those of you write these letters. Took seven of the churches that he establishes. He establishes one of the seven churches of Hyderabad with the white boxes. Peter and Paul are executed sometime in the late 60s, 66, 67. Persecution against Jews and the Christians on the rise because of, of the Roman emperor named Nero, who sees a very nice portion of land in Rome. He needs portion of land. He says, I'd like to build a big old pleasure palace right there. So he sets that area on fire. It has it set on fire. Blames it on the Christians. Tries to do what he can do to the people against the Christians. He does horrible things to them. Builds his pleasure palace and in an attempt to silence the Christian movement. He takes the two leaders and puts them to death. Peter and Paul. Hoping that that will set them up and instill fear in the rest of them. But it doesn't work. And John, one of the original twelve, now lives through all that. He's an old man. He gets exiled to the Isle of Patmos, where God gives him a vision, the revelation, the last book in the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And one of the first things he does is he identifies Jesus and Jesus' message to his seven churches that you see in the map at the bottom. Not quite as vivid as the one at the top, but he writes 
today is little creatures that are mentioned from the, that little dot up there in the middle of the sea, Patmos. And that's where he starts that letter, for three chapters. Writing to those churches, letting them know the good and bad of what they've done and what they need to do to respond positively. And then he begins to depict in very symbolic, graphic language what's going to unfold before Jesus returns to take his people. And he does all that at the end of the first century, A.D. History has it that he was boiled in oil a couple of times and probably couldn't see very well. And he finally got free from the Isle of Patmos and he went back to Ephesus, which would have been the church where he was the elder in charge now. Upwards of 90 years old, probably blind and very feeble. He writes first, second, and third John to encourage them. Hey, hang on. Jesus is who you say he is. You can make it. And tradition says that they used to carry him back and forth to church for their Ephesus. And you could hear him mumbling under his breath, my brothers. That was the wish of a dying man because that's the message of the Bible that I've tried to do my best to lay out chronologically for you tonight. Just giving you some information. But the truth is, this is God's love letter to us. To the last disciple, the person of life is God. And if tradition is correct, it was his desire that we love one another. In doing that, we can come to the world for Jesus Christ. The problem is, we have so much time to do with it. It's such a hassle to love people. Sometimes people are lovely and easy to love, but sometimes they are pain in the neck. You know what it means. Sometimes it's beyond our ability to make. That's where the body love is concerned. That's the love that John is That's the divine love that can tell God to write the scriptures to tell us his love story. I put you in a beautiful place in the garden and fail, but that's okay. You're going to fail a few times, but I always have a plan of redemption. It's not a backup plan. It's plan A. Because you are such boneheads, and because I love you so much, I will never, ever give up on you. And I will go to the greatest extent to demonstrate that love so that I can bring you back into a right relationship with me, a holy God that desires to have fellowship with you once again. I love you so much that I'm going to send my son to die for you, to pay a price for your sin that you can never pay for yourself. And if you'll only believe in him, you can have the eternal life that I promised in my world. That's what God is going to say for you. And really, you can toss the chronology out of the window for the sake of God. If you can be out to me, I pray that the only thing that you have done is what you just said. Then let us be to the ones that you will find ourselves in the places of the world. You have made it in the world. And it's Jesus. So much. And he's given us the power to understand. And I realize all of this is not going to sink in. As we teach through the Bible, we can make reference to this. And in time, it will all become clear of how all of these bits and pieces fit together in the world. And one beautiful lesson from God to us. Stay with me. Just 
calls us chorus. Here in your presence, we are undone. Here in your presence, heaven and earth become one. are new. 